elevating the discussion while talking about the things that matter most. You're listening to Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 139. Brian and I, Connor, here to talk about juries. And Brian, over the years, I've seen a lot of my friends uh, cringe at the idea of jury duty. They they get the notice in the mail and it's a shrug and it's a, ugh, you know, <laughs> and I get it, right? We're busy. It's one more thing. No, in fact, I, I've only in my adult life ever uh, once gotten a notice for jury duty. Have you ever been summoned for jury duty? I've been summoned a number of times. I've only had to show up once. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's not a given that if you get the thing in the mail, you're actually going to be on a jury by any means. In fact, the the prosecution and defense go through a jury selection process, which in many ways I don't like. It makes sense. They want to make sure that no one's got a conflict of interest and things like this. But, you know, if you're, for example, I'll probably never serve on a jury because they'll find out what I do for a living and they'll say, oh, no, you, you know too much about the law. We're going to remove you. You're dismissed, right? Which is unfortunate. And, and I say unfortunate because, Brian, I think, and I want to get your thoughts here, that serving on a jury would actually be a very important thing to do and not a, you know, begrudging, unfortunate, a a burdensome thing to do. I feel that the jury is very important in our criminal justice system and is often overlooked by people who don't understand its importance. What are your thoughts? I think I've been through a similar progression that you were describing where, you know, there was a time when I was, you know, receiving jury notices in the mail and I was like, oh, this is such an inconvenience. How can I get out of this? But then a few things happened and along the way I became woke. And um, basically I came to understand that sometimes it's the jury that, that is that last line of defense between um, the preventing of an injustice or allowing an injustice to be carried out. Mm-hmm. And once I understood that, jury duty took on a whole new meaning. So I'm I'm very supportive not only of being on the jury, but I think people need to be informed jurors, and they need to understand that the most powerful entity in that courtroom is the jury because they represent the people, as in we the people, the, where, where government obtains its legitimate authority. In theory. Yeah, in theory, (laughs) as it says in the textbooks. I have a story to share to kind of expound, Brian, on what you're saying, because it's one thing to talk about kind of how juries work or how they're made up or why they're important. Um, I like understanding some of the historical impact that the jury system has had, especially so in the case of William Penn. This is such an interesting story to understand uh, the power of the jury to uh, judge the justice of a law itself. It dates back to the the Magna Carta when the King of England was forced to pledge that he wouldn't uh, punish somebody for violating the law without the consent of his peers. And since that time, juries have used their their power in many instances to protect the rights of the accused and in some cases to raise awareness about an injustice. So in William Penn's case, he was a Quaker. He was a preacher for this kind of dissident religion in England because English... In England, uh, they had their kind of official religion. This guy's 26 years old at the time, and he was arrested in the year 1670 for violating the law. It was called the Conventicle Act, and this law prohibited that there be any religious assemblies of more than five people for illegal worship, right, for these kind of alternative religions. And so in defiance of the law, this guy, William Penn, goes to preach to a crowd of around 300 people outside of Grace Church in London. So clearly uh, and intentionally violating the law. So he's arrested. He gets put through the system. He has a jury in that case. And it was fascinating because the jury refused to convict him. Many of the, the jurors in this case felt very strongly that the law itself was unjust. And so they returned actually a verdict of guilt, but only on quote, speaking at Grace Church, which was not illegal. They convicted him of speaking, uh, which had no criminal penalty of any sort, rather than convicting him of preaching, uh, which did. And so in this case, there was a panel of judges, not just one. This this court process had a panel of judges. They were upset. And and so they, the presiding judge tells this to the, the jury. This is a direct quote. Gentlemen, you shall not be dismissed until we have a verdict that the court will accept. Wow. <laughs> right? Get in line. And, he continues, and you shall be locked up without meat, drink, fire, or tobacco. You shall not think thus to abuse the court. 
we will have a verdict by the help of God or you shall starve for it, end quote. So the jury gets locked up, repeatedly sequestered by the judges once they were denied food and water. And the judges are trying to force them to have a different result. But every time the same verdict was rendered for the you know alleged crime, not guilty. So the jury refused to convict him, even though they themselves were now being punished by the judges who wanted a guilty conviction. So finally, in frustration at the jury, Penn, uh, William Penn, the defendant, was thrown in jail. The entire jury was forced to join him, each of whom was fined a substantial sum for going against the court's wishes. So they're getting very punitive because they want to go after this, this Penn guy. So the jury foreman uh, could have paid but did not want to pay. This guy's name was uh, Edward Bushel. He refused to pay. He filed what's called a writ of habeas corpus to challenge this imprisonment, basically give me another court hearing to challenge what happened to me. And following weeks of incarceration, he won a legal challenge that established a precedent that has stood ever since, carried over to the Americas, and has been the the case here as well, that juries are independent of the court and cannot be punished for their decision. I love this, right? This is like the genesis of what juries have now become. You're not tools of the court. You're not tools of the justice system. You are an independent group of sovereign individuals who can tell the prosecutor and the judge, you know, the, the judicial equivalent of up yours, get lost, pound sand. We're not convicting this guy. You are independent. You cannot be punished. Interestingly, this William Penn guy uh, later then went on to form the colony Pennsylvania. And so that's the, the guy for whom uh, Pennsylvania is named. Quaker preacher, dissident guy who helped really prove the case for juries. So, Brian, when I think about today, we, we talk a lot about jury nullification, mm-hmm. right? You've heard this term, of course. We've chatted a little bit about it. And it owes its genesis to these original stories where the precedent was set that said, no, the juries are independent. They get to speak their mind. They get to make their own decision. And even if they've, uh, as in William Penn's case, even if they are technically guilty of the law, the jury can say, no, not guilty. We're not going to convict him. I love that. Oh, I do too. Now, you won't find very many attorneys or judges that will share, share your appreciation of it. Right. But that's the difference between an informed juror and an uninformed juror. See, I, I have the, I, I would call it fortune, some would call it misfortune, of having watched a, a handful of friends on trial for their lives. Uh, my friends of the Bundy family, um, Ryan Bundy and his brother Ammon, um, these guys stood accused of some really major stuff. I mean, we're talking, they just spent 300 years each in prison. There, there was no way they were going to, you know, draw breath as free men. Wow. But the jury in multiple trials, refused to convict because the government failed to make its case or there were holes or there were things that didn't add up. And there's a whole lot of guys who are free today because of the jury. Um, now, in, in, I have to clarify, in Ammon's case and Cliven and Ryan Bundy and Ryan Payne, mm-hmm. their case was, was dismissed with prejudice due to prosecutorial misconduct. But I talked with the, ver- I talked with the jurors themselves. I was, you know, they were there the day the judge announced the dismissal with prejudice. Right. And I asked those jurors, why would you be here? Why, why did you come back? And they said, there's no way we were going to convict. Wow. I mean, I talked to at least a half dozen of it. It only takes one right. to refuse. Right. But at least half of that jury, and, and, and from what I understand, it was pretty much all the jurors were like, no, we would not have convicted. Wow. So on the one hand, you know, you hear of, of you know, cases like O.J. Simpson. Right. Where the, the evidence overwhelmingly appears to show him guilty, but, you know, a juror comes out and holds up the raised fist of black power, you know, after he's acquitted. And it's like, really? Yeah. But um, that's that's the risk. Maybe some people will use their power of, as jurors like that. But there, I think there's great potential to avert misjustice. Like any tool, it can be used both for good and for bad. Yeah. It's yeah. why when we've talked to our friends on the left about jury nullification, they kind of bristle and they think about, you know, the antebellum South and white juries, you know, uh, convicting black people who are innocent or not convicting or acquitting rather white people who clearly were, were guilty. So like any tool in the justice system, it's not perfect. And yet you have the same tool being used for the Fugitive Slave Act, where you have people in the North who refused to return slaves as required by law. Um, because in the northern states uh, there was no slavery, and so they said we're not going to comply with this, and juries would not convict people who had, had violated the Fugitive Slave Act. And so, uh, like any tool, it can definitely be uh, used for good and for ill. But I think there's a reason why juries have historically been considered so important. I mean, John Adams, for example, 
uh, considered trial by jury, uh, along with representative government, to be the heart and the lungs of the liberty and security of the people. And my concern is that, you know, we've become so lackadaisical with the way the system actually works. Few people understand it. Few people care. It's just kind of monotonous and normal. People don't understand the gravity, the history, the the implications of it. And and you lose the uh, the understanding as to why these juries are so essential for the security of the people to hold the government in check, especially prosecutors. I mean, there there is no single person in the criminal justice system, not even the judge, who has nearly as much power as the prosecutor does. And it's the jury that can serve as a check on that. But if you don't care, if you don't know, if you don't show up, if you don't, if you're not willing to be on a jury, you know, you lose that opportunity to to give a very kind of careful, watchful eye to the government's power and and be that check. And it's not like me to recommend a lot of Hollywood stuff as an authoritative source, but if you haven't watched 12 Angry Men, it's a very thought-provoking film that, that can help illustrate, you know, why does it matter that people take that jury duty seriously? And, you know, of course, it may be a fictional account, but, but the message comes through loud and clear. And I, I've seen it, you know, with, with people that I know firsthand who, if it weren't for jurors saying, uh-uh, yeah. would likely be, you know, sitting in prison to this day. And to be fair, a lot of cases where juries are impaneled, uh, the person is definitely guilty. And yet what happens, Brian, is I think it's, it's some crazy statistic. It's like 98% of cases are resolved through plea deal, right? People are just like, okay, fine, you know, give me a slap on the wrist, give me probation, give me a lower charge, I'll, I'll plead guilty if you give me a lower criminal conviction, let's get this processed and move me through the system. And, and yet the, in many cases, uh, innocent people are willing to fight. They're willing to take it to a jury and appeal to the reasonableness of their peers. Now, on the other side, in many cases, innocent people don't want to gamble because if they gamble and then lose, then they're going to prison for 10 years, you know, or whatever the case may be. Um, but I get a lot of people reaching out to say, how, how can I make an impact? How can I make a difference? And among the list is when you get that jury notice in the mail, go. Because you may be involved in convicting an actually guilty person who's harmed someone else, in which case I say, great, you know, there should be a consequence imposed on people like that. But you may just land on a case where you have the, the rare opportunity to be a check on government overreach. And, and I can think of fewer opportunities, fewer ways to have a huge impact with a little bit of investment. If I can share an example of a place where I would love to have been that one juror. There was a, and, and I've looked in vain to try to, to, to verify the couple's name. There was a, an elderly couple who went to Mexico to serve a mission for their church. This was probably 10, maybe 15 years ago. It, it's been a little while. But uh, they moved to Mexico for the duration of their mission. And on their way home, they packed up their belongings in a trailer and they drove back to the United States. Well, unbeknownst to them, someone who had been helping them with packing had put a small package of drugs in with their personal belongings in the trailer. Mm-hmm. They get to the border, a drug dog alerts, and suddenly these folks are facing serious consequences. And unfortunately, the jury that they went before did not understand that uh, they, they, can, they can vote their conscience. They can prevent an injustice from taking place. So the only thing the jury was allowed to consider, did this couple have this in their possession when they arrived at the border? Yes or no? And based on that, this elderly couple, I think he was sent to prison for 10 years. And I can't remember if his wife, uh, I think she got super, like supervised parole or something like that. Hmm. But they, never, they had never done anything wrong in their life. And if just one juror had understood that, hey, guys, this doesn't fit the profile. But, you know, they, they were just told, you have to disregard everything else. Were they at the border? Was this in, found in their possession? Yes or no? This is such a travesty. Such a travesty. And, and Brian, this is actually a hostile power play by the judiciary. If you go back and you review the history of the jury as it's changed, there was a power play about a century or so ago by the judiciary who did not want juries exercising this independent power. They didn't want them to do what's called judge the law. They wanted them to judge the facts. As you say, did the person have drugs? Yes or no. Did the person have the money? Yes or no. Did the person have the car? Yes or no. It's basically just a robotic analysis of was the person there at the time or not? It, it is not uh, that they do not want juries to do what's called judging the law. Is it just that this person be convicted for this in the totality of the circumstances? And yet you see in our history, the first century um, of, of this country's existence, the way the juries were used is to judge both the facts and the law, right? 
And so you have, again, John Adams, out of many examples, he says, it's not only a juror's right, but his duty to find the verdict according to his own best understanding, judgment, and conscience, though in direct opposition to the direction of the court. Over and over again, uh, founding fathers, justices themselves, even the Supreme Court at one point, articulating this very thing that individuals should be judging both the law, uh, jurors, I should say, not just individuals specifically, should be judging both the law and the facts of the case. And yet we're in a system where the judges will direct the jury and, and tell them, you are only to judge the facts of the case. It is not up to you to decide the, this other stuff. That's not your analysis. You have to stick here. And you're supposed to, in many states, take an oath. You're, you're committing to do exactly what the judge tells you to do. All that notwithstanding, jurors still have the ability to acquit. And because of the precedent that I pointed out earlier, they cannot be punished. You, you can't be prosecuted. You can't be tried. They can't do anything to you if notwithstanding the judge saying, don't pay attention to that. Don't, don't judge the law. Don't do anything else other than say yes or no. You can just show up and say, sorry, not guilty. And they can't do a thing to you. The problem is because judges are, are you know, they have this air of authority and they know what they're talking about. And most jurors have no clue, right? They just showed up because they got a letter in the mail. People don't understand this, and so they're swept away by the, the judiciary's interpretation of the law. They don't understand their innate, inherent authority as, as jurors, and then they miss out on this opportunity to actually do justice. If I remember correctly, the couple that I referred to, the elderly couple who ended up you know, being convicted of smuggling drugs, at least one or more of the jurors from their trial was questioned afterwards and asked, you know, how could you, you know, send them and they, to, to prison? And the, the answer was, we really didn't have a choice or they, something to the effect of we didn't want to, but we didn't have a choice. And that's the cost of not knowing, yep. you know, what, what your authority is as, as a juror or understanding you, you can judge the law. You should judge the law. It you, should be more than just, you know, that, that pinhole view. And then instead of being a tool to check the government, you're a pawn of the state. You're, you're a tool, period. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Like a rubber stamp. Yeah. Oh, such a missed opportunity. So sad. Guys, juries are so important. Uh, there's the uh, FIJA, F-I-J-A, the Fully Informed Jurors Association. Great organization to check out. We'll link to them on today's show notes page, which is societyinthestate.com slash 139. I'm also going to link to Brian, a policy brief that we did here at Libertas on what we called juror discretion, just because police officers have discretion to arrest mm -hmm. you or not. Uh, prosecutors have discretion to charge you or not. Judges in many cases have discretion in sentencing and so forth. And and so our argument, uh, people call it jury nullification. That has a bad connotation. At the end of the day, it's just jurors exercising their discretion. It's the same power throughout the whole system. And yet the backstop of the system is often that the people involved are not even told that they have this power. So we'll link to those resources, societyinthestate.com slash 139. Guys, if you get your notice in the mail, go. You might be a tool, not a rubber stamp. Don't be a rubber stamp. You can be a tool of justice. Check the state. Let's make it happen. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com.